So when a group is comprised of a finite set of elements, we call that group a finite group. And we say that the number of elements that it has is the order of that group. We also, in our previous video, defined the notion of the order of an element of a group. And the order of an element in a group looks at the powers of that element and asks, what power do I have to take before that power becomes the identity element? That's what we define to be the order of an element in the group. And in the process of defining order, we sort of looked at the powers of one single element in a group. And when you look at the set of powers of, of one element, and we just consider that as a subset of our larger group, it turns out that that subset also enjoys the properties of a group, associativity, the closure property, the identity property, the inverse property. And so that subset of elements is a group in its own right. We call that kind of phenomenon a subgroup. So it's a subset of elements within a group that itself forms a group in its own right, using the operation inherited from the larger group. In this video, we want to begin to explore the definition of a subgroup and look at some examples, not just the kind that we've already seen when you look at powers of a single element, um, but also uh, subgroups of different types as well. And before we get to subgroups as a general notion, let's pick up from our previous video in thinking about what happens when we look at the powers of a single element. So we're going to do this by starting with a definition. The definition of what's called a cyclic group, or some people pronounce it cyclic. I prefer cyclic. Um, so when do we say that a group is cyclic? A group is called cyclic if there exists an element in that group. We're going to call it A. And this element has a unique property. The element A has the property that every element in my group, not just A, but every other element as well, can be written as some power of that single element A. So a group is called a cyclic group when there's a single element in that group whose powers give us all of the elements in that group. We know that A to the zeroth power is going to give us the identity element. A to the first power is going to give us A itself. But if A to the second power, A to the third power, and so on and so on and so on, if that accounts for every single element in the group, then we call that group cyclic. So as you might expect, this is a pretty special phenomenon. Most groups that we study are probably not going to be cyclic groups. But those groups that are cyclic, where this phenomenon happens, we call this element A a generator for that group. And it's called a generator because its powers generate all the elements of G. So let's take a moment and think about what kinds of properties these cyclic groups would have. So let's pick a group like U12, the multiplicative group of units mod 12. Is this group a cyclic group? So the question is decided by an existential claim. Can we substantiate this existential claim? Does there exist an element in this group whose powers give us all of the elements of this group? Is there a generator? Is one of these elements a generator for this whole group? And so let's be really brutal about this and just check each one of these four elements of U12, the, the residues mod 12, uh, which have multiplicative inverses. Can the powers of any single one of them generate the entire group? Well, let's start with 1. What do the powers of 1 look like? And powers, remember, mean the iterative operation uh, that's defined in the group. So 1 multiplied by itself mod 12, multiplied by itself mod 12, multiplied by itself mod 12, multiplied by itself mod 12. That's how we're to interpret these exponents that are happening over here. So remember, it's not always the same as the exponents of real numbers in the usual arithmetic system. In this case, it happens to agree just mod 12. Well, what do the powers of 1 look like? Even just as integers, we can see that they're all equal to 1. So the, the powers of the, the element 1 in this set only account for one of the elements in my set. We don't see 5, we don't see 7, we don't see 11. There's no power of 1 which is equal to either of those three things. And so what we'll write is we'll write that the set consisting of this the element 1 is what we get when we look at the powers of 1. So think of this little notation here as being the, the set of powers of the element 1. Um, and so because there's no 5, 7, or 11 in this set of powers, that means that 1 is not a generator for this group. OK, but that doesn't prove this group isn't cyclic. Right? It only shows that if it were cyclic, 1 is not 
one of the generators that we could have had. So let's check some others. If one's not a generator, what about five? What are the powers of five? Again, powers understood as repeated application of the operation in the group. Um, what do those powers look like? Well, five to the first power is five. Five to the second power is 25 as an integer, but mod 12 is one. And you'll notice that the first thing that we've seen is we've come back at the second power to the identity element of my group. So five happens to be an element in this group of order two. Right? The order of the element five is two. Which then also means that the third power of five is back to five, the fourth power is one again, the fifth power is five, and so on and so on. That pattern is just going to continue ad infinitum. And so while the powers of five account for one and five, they don't account for seven or eleven. There's no power of five in the mod twelve multiplicative group that gives me seven or gives me eleven. And therefore, we haven't generated the entire group with this element either. So a equals five is not a generator. Sure enough, when you check the powers of 7 and you check the powers of 11, those also don't have uh, enough influence to be able to determine all of the elements in our group. And so therefore, we've checked all four possibilities. None of the elements in this group generate the entire group. At best, they generate a two-element subset, right? namely the subset that consists of themselves and also one. And so because in this example we were able to exhaust all possible generators and find out that none of them were in fact generators, we therefore can conclude that U12 is not a cyclic group. We probably could have made a more sophisticated number theoretic argument for that, but this is not the course for us to do that. All right, if U12 doesn't succeed in being a cyclic group, at least it succeeded in getting us a new idea on the table, this idea of taking the set of all powers of an element. That's a special enough idea that we give it a name. We're going to call it the cyclic subgroup, generated by that element. So anytime I take an element in a group, and I look at the set of all of its powers, we can show, and this is a good exercise for you to do, that that set, the smaller set, in this case there's smaller sets than the whole group, right? That subset still enjoys all the properties of a group. Associativity, uh, closure, identity, inverses. And we call it a subgroup of G. And this particular kind of subgroup is called a cyclic subgroup. It's called cyclic because this subgroup has only a single generator. It's all of the powers of a single element. So in addition to calling this, for example, the set of powers of 5, we can even more fancily call it the cyclic subgroup generated by 5. And so this one 5 subset of G here is actually a subgroup. Now, what's the relationship between these two definitions? Well, if G is cyclic, that means that there's a generator that accounts for the entire group. Right, that its set of powers gives us everything in the group. So G is a cyclic group exactly when there's an element such that G is equal to the set of powers. Right? So when the cyclic subgroup generated by A gives me the entire group, G, that's exactly when we say that the entire group G is a cyclic group. So there are plenty of groups that are not cyclic that do have cyclic subgroups, like our U12 example. We decided U12, the whole group, was not cyclic. But there exist cyclic subgroups within it, like the cyclic subgroup generated by 5. So be very careful when you use the word cyclic. It's an adjective, so it needs to attach to a noun. And if you say cyclic group, that means one thing. It means the whole group is generated by a single element. Whereas if you say cyclic subgroup, you're talking about just the set of powers that that one element generates. And if G is not a cyclic group, those two can be very different things. So cyclic means that there's one element whose powers account for the entire group. And U12 evidently doesn't meet that standard. What about U11? I'm going to do this one a little bit more quickly and put the surprise out of the bag immediately. The surprise about U11, the set of multiplicative residues mod 11, actually is a cyclic group. Now to prove that something is a cyclic group, we need to substantiate this existential claim. We need to show that there exists a generator whose powers account for the entire group. And I'm going to claim that 2, the residue 2 mod 11, actually does account for all the elements in U11 when we look at its powers. And I'm just going to do that completely, brutally, explicitly. 2 to the first power, 2 to the second power, 2 to the third power, and up and up and up, mod 11. What we find out, by the way, as soon as we hit the 11th power, it's the same as the first power, mod 11. The, the 12th power is the same as the second power, mod 11, and so on and so on. Um, but let's take a look at what these are just by computing these powers mod 11. 
2 to the 1st is 2, 2 to the 2nd is 4, 2 to the 3rd is 8, and so on up, up to 2 to the 10th, which is 1024. Then we'll just reduce all of those mod 11. 2, 4, and 8, those are obvious. 2, 4, and 8, they're themselves when we reduce mod 11. 16 reduces to 5, 32 reduces to 10, uh, 64 reduces to 9, 128 to 7, 256 to 3, 512 to 6, and then 1024, when you divide that by 11, its remainder is 1. 1 happens to be the identity element inside the multiplicative group U11. And when you look across this list, this set of all powers of 2 in this group, right, because 2 to the 10th is equal to 1, that's exactly why 2 to the 11th will be the same thing as 2 to the 1st, because it's 2 to the 10 times 2 to the 1, right? and 2 to the 10 is 1 in this case. So the set of all powers of 2 actually accounts for every element of U11, from 1 up to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Every residue mod 11 that has a multiplicative inverse, so in other words, every element of this group is a power of 2. And therefore, U11 is a cyclic group, and one of its generators can be said to be 2. Right? 2 generates the entire group. Of course, an interesting question is, are there other possibilities? If I had picked on a different element here, maybe 4 or 9 or 7, would its powers also generate the entire group? And that's a question that you know, I'll leave for you to explore uh, on your free time. So now that we've seen some examples of cyclic subgroups, let's get the general definition on the table to close out our video. What is a subgroup more generally? A subgroup more generally is any subset of the elements of a group that itself forms a group under the same operation that the larger group has. Right? So it's any subset of elements that satisfies associativity, closure, identity, inverses. And the notation we use when H is a subgroup of G is slightly different than the notation we use when H is a subset of G. So if I write this, this is a subset symbol. This just means that all the elements of H are elements of G. When I use the subgroup notation, that means that not only are the elements of H elements of G, but also that that set of elements of H meets the criteria to be a group in its own right, where its operation is inherited from the larger group G. So we noticed that even when the set of powers of, of, of an element doesn't produce all of G, it does produce a subgroup. We can show that the set of all powers of a, of a given element inside of a group does form a subgroup of that larger group, group within a group. Um, and one of the reasons that we like to study subgroups is that they give us a clue to the structure of larger groups. Uh, if we want to understand how, to, how larger groups are built from smaller, understanding how subgroups relate to their parent groups uh, is a good way to do that. So we've seen some examples of cyclic subgroups that have been generated by a single element, the powers of a single element, but not every subgroup in the world is cyclic. So let's think about the symmetries of a hexagon for a moment. D6, or some authors write it as D12, the dihedral group of order 12. Um, all the symmetries of a regular hexagon. There are 12 of them, and here's a list of them. So what's an example of a subset of elements here that forms a subgroup? Well, what if I just take every other element the way that I've uh, ordered them here? So starting with E and then choosing R squared, R to the fourth, T, T R squared, and T R to the fourth. So that's definitely a subset of elements, but I claim that it's actually a subgroup. I claim that it uh, satisfies associativity, it's closed, so this purple list of, of elements here is closed um, under the operation of D6. And remember, the key is that the operation on those elements is the same as the operation on the larger group. So when I multiply R squared by R to the fourth, for example, I'm going to use the rules of the operation of D6 to simplify that. If I multiply R to the fourth by TR squared, then on the one hand, I can take one of these R's and a T, RT, and rewrite it using the rule for D6. RT is equal to TR to the fifth. And so that's the rule I'm going to use to make this T leapfrog this R. Because I'm trying, when I'm simplifying these elements in the dihedral group, I'm trying to push all the T's to the front of the line. Then I just need to do that same thing one more time, and then another time after that, and another time after that. And at the end of the day, nudge this up a little bit. At the end of the day, once my t is all the way in the front of the line, I have a total of 5, 10, 15, 20, 22 powers of r at the other side of the line. 
but every sixth power of r is going to be the identity element because the rotation of a regular hexagon, if I do it six times, I get back to the identity. And so since mod 6, 22 is congruent to 4, four powers of r are what survives. And so when I multiply r to the fourth times tr squared, I get tr to the fourth, which is also still an element in this subset. So it satisfies the closure property. That it satisfies the identity property is also fairly obvious because E is explicitly one of its elements. And we can also check that it satisfies the inverse property. The inverses of R squared and R to the fourth are each other. And the inverses of T, TR squared, and TR to the fourth are each themselves. So it satisfies all the properties that a group needs to satisfy. And therefore, this purple set is actually a subgroup. But it's not a cyclic subgroup because there's not a single element of this purple set here, the H set H, whose powers generate the entire subgroup, right? Um, the powers of R squared generate just R squared, R to the fourth, and the identity. The powers of T are just T and the identity. Same thing with the powers of this and the powers of that. So this is a subgroup, but it's not a cyclic subgroup because there's not just one generator that gives us the entire thing. What I want to do next is go into a little bit more theory about subgroups and develop some ways of telling when a subset is a subgroup. When does a subset meet that criteria of being a group in its own right? And this is kind of a neat theorem. It's going to give us some, some tests that we can apply in various uh, situations. Um, and so we're going to make that a separate video coming up next.